time. So it's not so easy to make an absolute opposition between that story and the Maccabean story. Okay? So, let me just end with two other things about this public celebration of Hanukkah. The notion of declaring a day, a public celebration, a government proclamation, is Greek. That's what the Greeks do all the time. They declare a day to be a holiday. So they're imitating the Greeks and celebrating their political independence by declaring Independence Day, the day of their rise to power, as being a holiday. The second thing that always goes along with when you think that God's hand is in history is you have to have historians to tell the story. The last historians we have in the Tanakh were in Ezra and Nehemiah. Now we have to have new historians, and that's, of course, where the books of Maccabees come from. But the history writing is half Tanakh, with lots of references to the Tanakh, as you saw, and half its Greek historical writing. What happened to that book in the end? It made it into the Tanakh. No. No. Yes. How? Wow. Into the Septuagint. It made it into the Tanakh of the Jews from Greece. Greece. I'm sorry, no, no, the Greeks speak of Jews of Egypt, of Alexandria. They got this wonderful letter and they were convinced. So it is part of the Tanakh, that is, the Tanakh, the ancient Tanakh of the Greek speaking Jews of <laughs> Egypt. What we don't know is why later on, whoever decided about the Hebrew Tanakh didn't include it. We have no idea. So I'm not going to talk a lot about what the rabbinic Hanukkah is. We all know the hypotheses that it was that the rabbis didn't like the Hasmoneans because they weren't the true high priests. And they didn't like them because they became kings and they're not from Ben David. And they didn't like them because later kings like Hyrcanus persecuted the Pharisees. And they didn't like them because some people say because the rabbis were pacifists, Yochanan ben Zakkai, and they were opposed to the zealots, the Sikari, who were like Matitya. There's a million theories of those kinds. And it all expresses itself by the rabbis intentionally left it out of the canon. To which I must admit that there's no evidence for any of that. Which is great because then the historians can do their own drashot. And I think the drashot are lovely. And many of us grew up on them and were inspired by them. And I have a piece here from Arthur Waska who makes that a central part of his understanding, of his Jewish renewal understanding of Hanukkah. I have nothing against Russia. I will only say that it's all based on arguments from silence. And I don't want to go into it anymore. But what is important to me is that Hanukkah becomes a home holiday, no longer tied to the temple, no longer t uh, tied to a civil war, right? And that when the rabbis did establish Al-Hanisim, Al-Hanisim, the Me'atim neged Rabim, the Tehorim neged the Tme'im, it seems to be they're talking about the battle of the Jews against the Greek Syrians. It doesn't seem to be that they're talking about a Jewish civil war. I don't think they celebrated it as a Jewish civil war. But there is some evidence about what the rabbis were trying to do. There's a midrash in Pesifta, either Rabati or Afghana, that says that when the Maccabees conquered the temple, they found that there were seven or eight, I guess eight spears. And they made us the uh, uh, spears. Right. So there clearly you're taking the symbol of warfare. And actually, if you think about it, the spears were in the wall. What they were were the standards from the, the military garrison. And they, they burnt the banners, and that becomes the basis for the right. Hanukkiah. Right, spin it the other way. You say, therefore, the Hanukkiah represents the military weapons they used to liberate the temple. It doesn't have to be anti-military because they used it. You could, you could, you could, I'm not saying the readings aren't reasonable and interesting, and value-wise, I like them. I'm just saying that the evidence is very sparse. I'm just going to leave it that way.